Hello friends and welcome back to another video. In case you have been living under a rock and haven't heard about this massive historical event, <laughs> this book has been in the making for a very very long time. I'm not sure exact years but I would guess around 10. I have very vague memories of reading like the draft of the first chapter of this on Stephanie Mayer's website probably in like 2009. It's just Twilight again but from Edward's point of view. It's like the exact same story as the first Twilight book but we have Edward narrating it instead of Bella. That That's it. That's what this book is. It's just the fact that it took so, 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 so long for it to come out that at this point it's just like, what? The year is 2020 and there's a new Twilight book? Okay, I have a video where I looked at the Twilight Renaissance on Tumblr, which is a bunch of 20-somethings who were fans of Twilight probably when they were like preteens or teens who are just getting back into it as a complete meme now. <laughs> and I kind of love it as someone who read Twilight in elementary school. I was not a fan. I read them. I didn't particularly like them. I was just like, yeah, it was okay. But like, I wasn't a fangirl. I like, I should have known how gay I was because I was just like, yeah, I read Twilight for the plot. I could not have given less of a shit about Edward and Bella's romance. I was just like, yeah, okay. Like, when are the Vulture gonna come and kill them? Like, but the Twilight Renaissance, on the other hand, is chef kiss perfection. So naturally, uh, when I found out that for some godforsaken reason, Midnight Sun was finally coming out, I kind of had to. You know, I kind of had to. <laughs> I got this, I pre-ordered this. I got this on August 4th, the day it came out. It took me about two weeks to get through all 650 pages. I didn't rush through it or anything. I could really only handle small doses. But finally, I am here today to provide you with my review. So going into this book, I did not expect it to be good. I expected it to be fun. I expected to kind of catch a glimpse of what I know people like about YA, even though I personally don't like it. I haven't actually read any in many, many years since the days when I was a massive edgelord teen, so all I was really hoping to do in reading this was to come at YA from a less pretentious perspective than I had when I was a teenager, and hopefully just have some stupid fun. Relish the Twilight Renaissance, etc. So let us begin with chapter one. My first impression is that, oh my god, Edward is one brooding bitch. And uh, that kind of checks. Like I said, Stephanie Meyer had like a decade to think about this book and it shows the most painfully detailed 18th century psychological realism novels have nothing on this. I'm just kidding. They're so much worse. But the detail of Edward's thought that she goes into, and also the thoughts of everyone else because he can read minds, is too much. It's it's too much, Stephanie. I think she literally even repeats herself about things a few times. Like, have we all just collectively agreed that it's so funny that there's a new Twilight book in 2020 that it doesn't even matter what she writes? So a few things stand out to me about chapter one. The first is that Edward mentions that he has two medical degrees and refers to high school students as children on multiple occasions, which makes sense. That makes complete sense considering he's like a hundred years old. But why? Why? This has literally been the biggest plot hole in Twilight in my mind for so long. Why do they not just go to university forever? Twilight wouldn't even be that different if it took place in like a small town university. Really not that much would have to change. The second thing is the very elaborate plan. No, multiple plans. The multiple plans he makes to murder an entire biology classroom. You know that scene where Bella first walks into the biology classroom and Edward catches a good sniff and it makes this face? That's the face of a man who is so sure he's going to eat her, he's counting how many necks he has to snap per minute to cover it up. I am so glad they didn't cast some boring hot idiots to play Edward and Bella, but especially Edward because any other actor would have played generic sexy love interest for the teenage girls. As if we do not already have enough of that in the world. No. Robert Pattinson fully grasps what a weirdo Edward is and he gives us all of it. This is positively unhinged in the realm of YA love interests and I don't think we give him enough credit for it. Her scent hit me like a battering ram, like an exploding grenade. There was no ooh, image violent enough to encompass the force of what happened to me in that moment. Instantly I was transformed. I was nothing close to the humid I'd once been. No trace of the shreds of humanity I'd managed to cloak myself in over the years remained. I was a predator. She was my prey. There was nothing else in the world but that truth. There was no room full of witnesses. They were already collateral damage in my mind. The mystery of her thoughts was forgotten, for she would not go on thinking them much longer. I was a vampire, and she was the sweetest blood I'd smelled in more than 80 years. The innocent bystanders in this classroom 
18 other children and one man could not be allowed to leave, having seen what they would soon see. In chapter two, we get the mitosis scene. If you weren't aware, Edward and Bella's first conversation is about mitosis. And if you thought it was delightfully too long in the movie, well, you're gonna go feral over this because like I said, everything in this book is too long. There's never any room for the reader's own thoughts or analysis of what's going on because you're just constantly being slapped with Edward's 100% honest interpretations of what's going on. Every little thing that's going on. One could argue that this is a very calculated artistic choice, that this is the best way to capture the way that Edward experiences the world. Being able to read minds, everything is kind of this very non-nuanced open book to him. So what we experience reading this novel full of intense psychological details and absolute truths is really what it's like in his head. I don't know if that was Stephanie Meyer's reasoning, but I'm like only 50 out of 650 pages in at this point and I am a little bored. So after mitosis, they have some hashtag deep talks about why Bella left Arizona and about her parents and stuff. And Edward still wants to eat her. He talks to Emmett after class and Emmett is like, bro, just like, it's fine. Like we all fuck up sometimes. Like just do a little oopsie murder. It's fine. We've all done it. Another iconic moment from Twilight is when Edward stops a car from hitting Bella with his bare hands. Uh, it's a little different in the book by which I mean a lot more long-winded and convoluted, probably especially in this one because Bella was unconscious for most of it, so it wouldn't be in Twilight Twilight. Maybe it is. I have literally haven't read it since the fifth grade, so please don't quote me on my knowledge of the original Twilight book. I am mainly comparing this to the movies. You can probably, I found this in like a lot of my books from this era. Does it have like my child handwriting of like Tia on the inside cover is what I'm looking for? I don't think it does. Like. There she is. Hello, I said in the quiet voice I used when I wanted to make humans more comfortable, forming a polite smile with my lips that would not show any teeth. <laughs> she looked up then, her wide brown eyes startled and full of silent questions, and I stared into those oddly deep brown eyes. The color was like milk chocolate, but the clarity was more comparable to strong tea. There was a depth and transparency near her pupils. There were tiny flecks of agate green and gold caramel. I realized that my hate, the hate I did ma imagined this girl somehow deserved for simply existing, had evaporated. I see why this would be extremely exciting to super fans of Twilight, because not only do you get to reread the same story that you already love again from a different perspective, but you get two different texts of the exact same conversation from different perspectives, which I'm sure it's been done before, but it is still pretty unique, and it certainly elevates the Twilight experience for anyone who really cares to get that deep into it. The writing is it does okay it, it does what it's aiming to do really well it doesn't bother me in the same way that like bad fan fiction or onision's books do or even some published books where i'm just like what the fuck is going on what are you talking about when i read midnight sun i'm just like oh my god you annoying angst-filled bitches with your eyes glistening with unshed tears like but it's twilight it's twilight what do you expect from twilight meyer does the thing that she's doing very, very well, regardless of what your personal taste is. On the flip side, I am also a little bit mad at this chapter because I realized that something that there was the opportunity for in this book that is not being done so far was to show the relationships between the Cullens a little bit better. Yes, we've gotten some never before seen interactions between them, but all I really know about them so far is that Rosalie is hot and self-absorbed, Emmett is big and strong and doesn't use his brain very much, Jasper hungry, Alice and Esme are nice. Carlisle is like this saintly daddy figure. I unironically like the Cullens, but now I'm like, what? Are all of my memories of them being interesting a lie? Chapter four. So the whole Bella thing is still causing a little bit of conflict amongst the Cullens. Edward is worried that Jasper is going to just murder her to get it out of the way because he hungry. So their two options right now are essentially to stay in Forks or to just run off into the distance before they accidentally cause some murders. Alice has some visions. She sees two possibilities for the future. One in which she sees herself being BFFs with Vampire Bella and another one in which Edward just straight up kills her. So these are the only two possible fates for Bella, essentially. Uh, in this chapter I am happier with the Cullens. I'm convinced that they're all distinct characters, um, but like happier is not happy, you know? Chapter five, Edward grows increasingly obsessed with Bella, starts stalking her everywhere. In the original Twilight, there's obviously Bella's obsession and eventual romance with Edward, but there's also her high school friends, there's Jacob, there's her parents. Like she has other concerns. What I was looking forward to most about this book was Edward's other concerns. Oh my fucking God, am I still reading Twilight for the plot? 
<laughs> I, oh my god, I hate myself, I just realized that. Okay, so I was looking forward to Edward's other concerns, but like he doesn't have any. This is really just Twilight, like, but told by a stalker in the bushes trying to interpret everything Bella's doing instead of by her. Like, it's objectively not very good. It would not hold up as a book on its own without the original Twilight as context. Edward watches Eric and Mike fight over Bella and who's gonna take her to the dance, but she's not like other girls. She's not going to the dance. She's going to Seattle for some cryptic reasons that we never find out in this book. He also watches her sleep and has the revelation that he is in love with her. So actually this high school kid that he just a second ago was calling a child, rightfully because she's like 90 years younger than him, is now actually really hot and he wants to date her. This is because Bella is a very special snowflake. She is nice, she's generous, She's modest, whereas other humans are all self-absorbed and shallow. Edward spends so much time in this book, like, God, humans are such mundane pieces of shit and no match for my big galaxy brain, except for Bella because she's nice to me. Chapter six, Edward asks Bella to sit with him at lunch because he's done being good and given up staying away from her. <laughs> Dialogue between Edward and Bella is really fun, I'm not gonna lie. It's so cheesy, it's that contrived, like, witty, passive-aggressive, like, flirt-arguing thing, but, like, she writes it well for what it is, and it's fun, and it's a very welcome break from all of Edward's stupid brooding. So, okay, so Bella has some theories about what it is that is so, um, interesting about Edward. I'll figure it out eventually, she promised, and when she did, she would run. What if I'm not a superhero? What if I'm the bad guy? Her eyes widened by a fraction, and her lips fell slightly apart. Oh, she said, and then, after another second, I see she'd finally heard me. Do you? I asked, working to conceal my agony. <laughs> You're dangerous, question mark, she guessed. Her breathing hiked and her heart raced. I couldn't answer her. This was, was this my last moment with her? Would she run now? Could I be allowed to tell her that I loved her before she left or would that frighten her more? But not bad, she whispered, shaking her head. No fear evident in her eyes. No, I don't believe that you're bad. You're wrong, I breathed. <laughs> Edward goes to his car and listens to a calming CD which is something that he does a lot, but it isn't always a calming CD, it always matches his mood. So sometimes you get these absolutely amazing phrases like, I went to my car and listened to a violent CD. And then suddenly he sees Bella pass out on the ground and he runs over to go steal her from Mike Newton, who was taking her to the school nurse's office. She got nauseous in biology class at the sight of blood because they were doing like the blood typing thing where you prick your finger or whatever. At this point, I am so desensitized to Edward's brooding bullshit, but like, I need you to know that it's constant. I used her momentary distraction to experiment with breathing. I inhaled carefully through my nose. Potent. I clutched the steering wheel tightly. The rain made her smell better. I wouldn't have thought that possible. My tongue tingled in anticipation of the taste. The monster wasn't dead, I realized with disgust, just biding his time. I tried to swallow against the burn in my throat. It didn't help. This made me angry. I had so little time with the girl. Look at the lengths I had already gone to in order to secure an extra 15 minutes. I took another breath and fought with my reaction. I had to be stronger than this. What would I be doing if I weren't the villain of this story? I asked myself. How would I be using this valuable time? I would be learning more about her. What is your mother like? I asked. <laughs> this is like the entire book. This is this is the entire book. On to chapter seven, we finally get some good exclusive Colin content. Yes, I did come here for Emmett and Jasper playing 4D chess while Alice secretly mouths all of Emmett's next moves to Jasper. Edward also composes Bella's lullaby, which they made into an actual song for the movie soundtrack. It slaps. The, the Twilight soundtrack has no no right to slap as hard as it does, but it does, that's a, that's a whole other rant. Something they definitely glaze over in the movie is that Edward's a big piano player slash composer, so he composes this song. Esme is a real proud mom about it. Also, we find out later in this book through backstories that she's literally younger than him, but I guess she's his mom now because Carlisle wanted to smash. Esme is the least interesting Colin, I think. Honestly, she reminds me of, like, a girl defined, like, good Christian wife and mother type. Like, Carlisle is the big, strong, respectable head of the household, and Esme has a lot of feelings and is supportive. It's an ongoing thing in this book that everybody else thinks Bella's just so, like, 
plain and unassuming, even though there's a minimum of like four guys into her in this book. And Edward is just so galaxy brained for appreciating her true beauty. She's just a normal girl with like perfect skin and hair and beautiful eyes who is perfectly thin and obviously white. What a unique acquired taste that he is so cultured for appreciating. Where is my heroine slash love interest who is not conventionally attractive. I genuinely don't think I've ever read a book that is not a book that does that, that is not also super cringy and self-congratulatory about it. Show me the weird looking women who are just living the best lives. Where are they? Not in fiction. And I'm salty about it. Two other vampires who are friends with Jasper are going to be visiting town, so Edward makes it his, his mission to protect Bella, especially during that time because she attracts danger so easily. And uh, he goes to watch her sleep again. I did not see much of Jasper's guests for the two sunny days that they were in Forks. I only went home at all so that Esme wouldn't worry. Otherwise my existence seemed like that of a specter rather than a vampire. I hovered invisible in the shadows where I could follow the object of my love and obsession, where I could see her and hear her in the minds of lucky humans who could walk through the sunlight beside her. So Edward continues to stalk Bella and now, we arrive at the old mushroom ravioli scene. Bella gets separated from her friends while shopping, and so she's walking alone and these men are planning to assault her. Edward hears that in their minds and zooms in to save her. But this time around, from Edward's point of view, because that's the whole gimmick of the book, we get to hear all of his murder fantasies again. He really wants to torture them slowly, but he's not gonna do that because he's a good boy. And even back in the day when he used to eat murderers and rapists, he always killed them quickly no matter how evil they were. Apparently, the worst person he ever encountered was this psychopath with a basement torture chamber. And that's, that's that on that. This little bitch boy goes on for like 20 pages at a time about his angst. And then we get one paragraph like, oh yeah, that time with the basement torture chamber. Sure killed that guy quickly, huh? What? Okay. <laughs> he drives Bella to the Italian restaurant where she was going to meet her friends, but they've already eaten because they suck. So now Edward and Bella are like kind of on a date. The waitress is really horny for Edward. Also, yeah, he's constantly having to hear women's sexual fantasies about him. Like this is a common occurrence. Obviously it's a book for teens. So we're not gonna go into too much detail about anything, but like, Apparently this is a really common occurrence. Even Anna Kendrick has some fantasies about Edward. He completely admits to uh, stalking Bella and being able to read minds, but that's fine. It ends up totally cool because she's like into it. These psychos are made for each other. That's not even a roast. That's probably the intended takeaway of this scene. On to chapter 10. At this point, my counting of chapters and division of this video into like chapter by chapter is kind of breaking down. It goes to complete shit by the end, but I did write that this was where chapter 10 begins here. So anyway, I'm sorry about the complete lack of organization. So chapter 10, all of the secrets are out now, which really surprised me because the say it out loud scene is, is probably the most iconic Twilight scene. I expected that to be in the book because it does lift a lot of dialogue directly from the book. There's a lot of dialogue in here that is recognizable from the movie, word for word. So I, I was waiting for that scene, but no, that's that's just the movie did that. So they have a hashtag deep talk in the car after some mushroom ravioli, and uh, she knows everything now. Her reactions were always wrong, always completely wrong. She pulled danger towards herself. She invited it. How was I supposed to protect someone so, so, so determined to be unprotected? No, she said in a low voice that was inexplicably tender. It doesn't matter to me what you are. She was impossible. You don't care if I'm a monster, if I'm not human? No. So here's where we're at. Bella is not afraid of Edward, even though she definitely should be. She's almost died like 50 times already in this book. The fates are really determined to kill her, but Edward has made himself her like guardian angel or guardian vampire, which is ironic because he's technically the most dangerous thing to her how poetic. And also they're both secretly in love and obsessed with each other in like an awkward high school kind of way. So now Edward is stuck with the question about what to do about the rapist slash murderer on the loose who almost attacked Bella. So he goes to Daddy Carlisle and Carlisle is like, I know exactly what to do. Grab the mysterious black bag and let's drive off into the distance. And I'm like, oh bitch, yes, I want to go rapist hunting with Edward and Carlisle. This is what I'm here for, even though they're probably going to leave him alive like the good Christian vegans that they are. It's fine. I'm still on the hype train. Turns out as soon as they arrive, Edward runs back to Forks to watch Bella sleep again and whatever Carlisle does happens off screen. Why would you do this to me, Stephanie? Hello again. This is a bit of a long one, so I'm filming it on two different days. It is a disgusting rainy day outside, so I am drinking tea. I am wearing my coziest sweater, which also happens to be my merch. Link in the description below. Chapter 11. Edward drives Bella to school. 
and Jessica Stanley sees them together. This is Anna Kendrick's character, who I always just call Anna Kendrick. Naturally, she has to interrogate Bella later. Edward is reading Jessica's mind during this interaction, so this is how he knows <laughs> what's going on. So Jessica's like, OMG Bella, do you like him? And Bella's like, too much. More than he likes me, but I don't see how I can help that. And Edward gets very hung up on this. This is outrageous. How the fuck does she think that she likes him more when he is the one stalking her 24 seven and losing his mind at the sight of her collarbones. Honestly, he kind of has a point. Also, we have confirmation that the pomegranate is a Persephone reference. Maybe this is a thing that was said in the OG series and the super fans got it the second they saw the cover, but I was waiting for confirmation and she does in fact explain the metaphor very thoroughly. Get rid of that. Well, there it is. Wow. I'm just gonna get rid of that because it's annoying. Ah, she'd done nothing to deserve my underworld. There it is. <laughs> This is what I just spent like a whole minute looking for. Anyway, I have a feeling this half of the video is going to be a little bit more unhinged. She agrees to spend a romantic weekend alone with him, but he's like, please at least like tell your dad about it so at least someone knows where you are and then I have less incentive to murder you because then it would be traceable. And she doesn't really feel like doing that. Chapter 12, 250 pages in, and these assholes are just now working up to holding hands. My hand moved toward her without my permission, just to touch her hand, to hold it in the darkness. Would that be such a horrific mistake? If my skin bothered her, she only had to pull away. I yanked my hand back, folded my arms tightly across my chest, and clenched my hands closed. No mistakes, I promised myself. If I held her hand, I would only want more! Oh my god, girl defined was right! <laughs> Another insignificant touch, another move closer to her, I could feel that. A new kind of desire was growing in me, working to override my self-control. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. Chapter 13, Edward watches Bella sleep again. He does that a lot. Uh, <laughs> this time, he just straight up sticks around until the morning without being noticed and listens to her and Charlie eating breakfast together. Apparently the fact that he can't read her mind is some kind of freaky genetic thing because he can't read Charlie's mind very well either. He just gets like vague feelings from him. So that's weirdly kind of anticlimactic of a way to explain why he can't read her mind. It's twilight, <laughs> I said. The time when vampires come out to play when we never had to fear that, shif that a shifting cloud might cause us trouble, when we could enjoy the last remnants of light in the sky without worrying that we would be exposed. I looked down to find her staring curiously at me, hearing more in my tone than the words I'd just spoken. It's the safest time of day for us, I explained, the easiest time, but it's also the saddest, in a way, the end of another day, the return of the night. So many years of night, I tried to shake off the heaviness in my voice. Darkness is so predictable, don't you think? Oh, <laughs> hashtag deep. I like the night, she said, contrary as usual. Without the dark, we'd never see the stars. Hashtag fucking deep. You know what? I'm not even gonna re-say that line. I'm just gonna keep my text message in here because this is the shitty part of the video. Welcome to hell. I could probably make that into a fucking pomegranate reference if I... Anyway. <laughs> That's what I'm calling this video. Jacob and his dad, Billy, catch a glimpse of Edward and Bella together. This is the first time we've seen Jacob, I believe. If we saw him before, it wasn't important and I didn't write it down. So Jacob being a dumb himbo is just like, wow, cool car, bro, and goes on obsessing over Bella. But Jacob's dad knows what's up and is like, oh, fuck. That's a whole vampire. And that's where the chapter ends. Intrigue. Chapter 14. Edward watches Bella sleep. That is how, like, the past 20 chapters have begun. We're on chapter 14, but the past 20 chapters have begun with Edward watching Bella sleep. He asks her about, like, previous dates that she's been on, and she's like, well, one time in the sixth grade, I went to a guy's birthday party and I was the only one who showed up. My eyes narrowed, so you've never met anyone you wanted? She sighed again, not in Phoenix. We stared at each other for a moment while I processed that fact. Just as she was my first love, according to this, I was also her first. This alignment pleased me in some strange way, but also troubled troubled me. Surely this was a warped, unhealthy way for her to begin her romantic life. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And then you do nothing with that fact. <laughs> So Edward and Bella are being all disgusting and romantic in the cafeteria, which again, it feels like they've been doing for the past 20 chapters. And suddenly Alice is like, OMG, we gotta go. Like now nah, we have to leave. Not out loud though, cause like Edward reads minds, remember? Yeah. Their little like weekend romantic thing is th this weekend. And Edward plans to take Bella to this meadow. Another iconic Twilight scene. He plans to take her to this meadow, but Alice's visions of him murdering her are also in that meadow. So it's 
woo, intrigue, <laughs> you know? We gotta fucking go and like figure this out and have another family angst session to talk about Bella. And Edward and Bella are like, OMG no, we have to go a whole few hours without seeing each other. Before the two possibilities were Edward murders her or she becomes a vampire, but now there's a slim chance that he can stay and be with her while she's human, although obviously she'll age. And this makes him very emo, he thinks about killing himself, but this is apparently very hard to do for vampires. Pretty much the only way to do it is to piss someone off enough to do it for you, which is exactly what Edward tries to do in New Moon. But anyway, Edward is preparing for their uh, romantic day in the woods. Uh, and I quote, I slipped into a white cotton shirt, unnerved by the look of my bare arms in the mirror inside the door. I buttoned it, sighed, then unbuttoned it again. Exposing my skin was the whole point, but I didn't want to have to be so conspicuous right from the start. I grabbed a pale beige sweater and pulled it over the top. I was much more comfortable that way, just the collar of the white shirt showing above the crew neckline. Maybe I would leave the sweater on. Maybe full disclosure was the wrong path. He's trying to be a little sexy, show a little bit of ankle for Bella, is how this reads. I mean, actually, he's planning that he's gonna, like, walk out into the sunlight and be like, look how disgusting I am when I sparkle. So he's like, he needs to show skin so that like the vampires tend to dress like good Christian women because like, you know, if, if a cloud shifts, they don't want to like show any sparkle. So the point is that he's trying to show a little sparkle for her, but it reads like he's preparing his seductive forearms for her. And I just really like that. He goes to watch her sleep again and hears her blow drying her hair. <gasps> what an occasion. So she cares about her appearance for their date too. Oh my God, they're so in sync. Time for a flashback to 1919, thank God. We get this cute scene where Carlisle surprises Edward with a Christmas tree for his first Christmas as a vampire. We see Edward's gradual learning to live among humans and be a vegan vampire. We find out that he actually rebelled for a few years and went off to eat rapists and murderers for a while in like a vigilante sort of way, which is actually pretty lit. But no, he's like, I'm better than these fleeting pleasures and I'm going to go back to Daddy Carlisle and be vegan, so. Chapter 16, Edward watches Bella sleep in the morning, the very anticipated day of their date in the woods thing, uh, they accidentally wear the same outfit, which is blue jeans with a white button down and a beige sweater on top. So, congratulations, you look like someone's two moms. Before they go out hiking, she takes her sweater off and oh my god, she wore a short sleeve shirt under the sweater too. She has elbows, holy shit. She watches him sparkle and thinks it's beautiful. He plays 4D chess with his own brain, trying to master being around her, etc. They go to the meadow and, oh boy, I was not ready for this. And now we begin the third sitting of me trying to film this video. She leaned closer and laid all of her hand against my forearm, slowly stroking down towards my wrist. Her skin felt fever hot against mine, and though a tremor quivered through her fingers, there was no fear in that touch. My eyelids slipped closed again, and I tried to contain my reaction. The electric current felt like an earthquake rocking through my core. They're talking about almost holding hands. Do you mind? She asked, and her hand paused in its progress. No, I responded quickly, and then, because I wanted her to know some little bit of my experience, I continued. You can't imagine how that feels. <laughs> They're talking about almost holding hands. <laughs> I could never have imagined it before that moment. It was beyond any pleasure I'd felt. We also arrive at the iconic Twilight piggyback scene. It struck me how easy it was not to carry her insignificant weight, but to have her literally wrapped around me. My thirst was so wholly overshadowed by my happiness that it barely caused me any conscious pain. I took her hand from where it was gripped around my neck and held her palm to my nose. I inhaled as deeply as I could. Yes, the pain was there. Real, but unimpressive. Easier all the time, I breathed. So the piggy vaccine. Bella immediately gets nauseous and has to sit down again, but this gives them the opportunity for a smooch. Just one, just one good smooch before marriage? What could possibly go wrong? So I'm really zooming through the book at this point because really not that much happens. This is not a book that you need to read carefully very often and I, at this point I've kind of sunk to skimming most of the hand-holding and gushing over each other, which is 95% of it. They kiss one more time and Bella faints because she forgets to breathe and apparently that's adorable. 
and not weird at all. She asks if vampire sex works the same way and Edward admits to being a 104 year old virgin. She goes to visit the Cullens with him and everybody loves her. Esme is a little uncomfortably invested in her son finally getting some after 104 years. Yeah, I don't know what to make of that. This is the book for you if you are just like Team Edward for life, Team Edward or death, Jacob can leave, because he has been mentioned like once as some guy who repeated an old legend to Bella and that's how she eventually made the connection to Edward being a vampire. So if Jacob is just some guy in the background, then um, this is for you. Chapter 21, speaking of which, they actually do encounter Jacob again. He is referred to as a child and the boy by Edward. And Bella's like, hey, don't call him a child. He's not that much younger than me. And Edward is like, I know. Very clear in this book on multiple occasions that he sees teenagers as children and also dates one. And now it's vampire baseball time. Yes, after 500 pages. After 500 pages. We have just now made it to the vampire baseball scene, which means it's time to introduce the actual villains of this book. After 500 pages. Edward describes James pretty hilariously as the, um, the smaller, ill-favored male. In this squad we have the obvious leader and then the fucking greasy one. So James gets a good sniff of Bella and decides that it is now his life's goal to eat her because he's a tracker and he lives for the thrill of the hunt and he'll never stop until he catches his prey. So Laurent heads over to the Cullen house and is like, hey guys, so just so you know, James is like really good and totally gonna get you. Um, and also I need to go immediately before he gets me for talking to you. He ends up tricking everyone into thinking he has Bella's mom hostage, so Bella does this weird self-sacrifice thing and goes to give herself up to him, but obviously the Cullens show up and save her at the last minute. This is just some more, um, Twilight plot recap for you. Honestly, I have the least beef with these chapters because things actually happen. I would go as far as to say I might even be invested in what's gonna happen if I didn't already know this story. Um, it works really well as a climax to the story from Edward's point of view too because of course he has to face his greatest fear of killing Bella like James bites her so he has to suck the venom out. We see how much he's grown from the beginning of like thinking he's going to kill 20 people on the spot just to get to her to being able to drink her blood and stop. I think Twilight worked so well as a movie. One because the soundtrack, the aesthetic, all of that stuff slapped a lot. But it also works because we got to keep all of the good storytelling and the main plot points and cut out all of the stuff with them brooding and going, no, I love you more. No, I love you more. Oh my God, no, I love you more. And this book is 200 more pages than Twilight. It doesn't need them. It, it doesn't need them. This book would be so much better if it was half as long, probably less than half as long, a third as long and this book would be a much more enjoyable experience. It sucks that I got so mentally done with this book by the end because the two, the last 200 pages really don't suck that much. Things happen, the pacing is so much better. A piece of Twilight lore that I actually completely forgot was how James solves the mystery of how Alice became a vampire because her whole backstory is like, she just woke up in a field one day as a vampire and she doesn't remember her human life at all or why she has visions. It turns out she had visions when she was a human too. So she was in an asylum in the 1920s. James caught a good sniff. He really wanted to eat her. She smelled tasty as heck like Bella, except he didn't um, fall in love with her and we didn't get um, 650 pages of angst. Uh, no, he just um, tried real hard to eat her, but another vampire got to her first and she ended up waking up in a field instead. It's dumb and way too convenient, but <laughs> it's Twilight. Edward decides he should take Bella to prom. Now there are many catches to this. He wants her to go because what if one day she grows old and has human children? What is she gonna tell them when they ask her about important things like prom? She has to have these fundamental human experiences. I personally, if you hadn't guessed, don't really love the idea that having a romantic prom and getting straight married and having two to three kids one day is the fundamental human experience. Uh, the highlight of my prom was falling down the stairs and my tailbone being bruised for like two weeks after that. And I turned out great, clearly. So he's got some interesting reasons for thinking that she needs to go to prom. The other catch is that she does not want to go at all. She hates attention, she hates dancing, she's not like other girls, etc. So he's like, hey, how about Alice gives you a makeover like for fun and then I drive you somewhere. And she's obviously real mad at first, but of course she comes out of her shell and has a great time because 
every clumsy introvert secretly wants to be beautiful and dance with their vampire boyfriend at prom. Sometimes weird introverts are not waiting to blossom and look hot at prom. Sometimes <laughs> they're just weird introverts and that's fine. So I'm just gonna offer that up to all my weird introverts who fell down the stairs at prom. <laughs> and um, but anyway, that's the end of the book. <laughs> that's the end of the book. I had a bad time. Not nearly as bad of a time as like Onision or Girl Defined, but like this was a fucking slog to get through. There's some gold for sure, but it's absolutely not worth reading for those few moments of gold. Unless you're a massive Twilight super fan and you unironically love the Twilight universe and care about these characters. In that case, yeah, read it and enjoy it. And I have nothing against anyone who unironically thinks this book is great. If it brings you joy, it brings you joy. The whole reason why I'm interested in Twilight on this channel is because it brings me joy. The movies, the Twilight Renaissance fandom on Tumblr, it, it, it sparks joy. This book was too long and I didn't really enjoy reading it, but um, Twilight sparks joy these days, and I absolutely no judgment on people who love reading the books. Thank you ever so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to my YouTube channel and support me on Patreon. I do live Q&As every single Wednesday on Discord. I have nothing else to add. That's it. That's the end of the video. I have been doing YouTube for like three years and I still struggle with outros. Okay, goodbye. I'm done. <laughs>